Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Samad Samana. I cover software here at Jefferies, including ServiceNow. And with us, we have Pablo Stern, SVP of IT Workflows at ServiceNow. And so we're very thankful that you're able to join us, Pablo. It's uh, certainly a lot going on in both uh, the software industry and kind of the world in general. And uh, we appreciate in advance you to take some time out to, to share your thoughts with us. And so you know, I, I think since uh, some investors get less face time with you, I actually think this is going to be a really interesting conversation because it'll be more product oriented and maybe less short term. And so, you know, but, but if we could maybe start at one high level question, we get asked all the time about maybe the, the total addressable market and, and especially in the context of uh, IT and, and how much opportunity is left there for service now. So if maybe you could start there and frame the TAM and frame the opportunity in ITSM and, and the other IT products. And I think we'll go from there. Sure. And <clears throat> Simon, first of all, great, great to see you again. And then uh, really to everybody else, uh, hopefully that uh, people are doing well under you know, everything that's going on in the world right now. Um, you know, if, as we look at the ITSM market, and we haven't publicly disclosed our assessment of how large the market is, but if you look at Gardner, they've sized it about 5 billion, and then we're roughly about half of that. Um, but you know, when we look at when we look at the market, <clears throat> I'll, I'll say a couple of things that we see. One is, you know, within our existing customers, the six six thousand customers that we have, like we're probably under fifty percent penetrated with our ITSM solution in those existing accounts. <clears throat> and then on top of that, there is the you know almost thirty thousand other enterprises uh, from a total market perspective. So we're only serving a, a fraction of that. So we actually think that the the overall market is probably underrepresented. Um, and this goes back to like when, when we first IPO'd and, and the market was originally seen to be about a $1.5 billion market. Like, you know, we're, we're clearly over that uh, just with, with our ITSM product today. So and net net, I think that there's, there is a tremendous amount of potential for us to continue to grow within just the ITSM market. I'm sorry, I was on mute. Great. Uh, that's helpful. And then, you know, I think that with the, the rollout of ITSM Pro, we've been asked the question a lot. Um, you know, how do we think about maybe the primary features and functionality differences between the core ITSM offering that, that ServiceNow historically had and, and what Pro offers? And, you know, how should we think about the, the, the main differences there? Yeah. So, so if you think about it, from an ITSM perspective, as we, as we came into this market, um, just <clears throat> with, with the, the standard solution that we, we ultimately still provide, you had this need from customers, which was, hey, as we ship the cloud, drive uh, a SaaS-based solution, really do so from a one platform perspective with that one data model and architecture that we have. Like that in and of itself was enabling our customers to deliver those experiences to employees and also to the knowledge workers within IT. and, and now, from a pro perspective, what we're hearing from customers is really driving a focus in two areas. One is continuing to improve the employee experience. And even amidst the, the pandemic, like I still hear this a lot in talking to CIOs and their directs in terms of a focus for companies as they're really trying to bring on board and, and keep captivated the employees by giving them better experiences. And then the second big thing that they're also trying to do is they're trying to do that while being as effective and efficient as possible and making sure that the work that they're spending their time on is high value. And so ITSM Pro is really focused on delivering both of those outcomes. We take the power of AI and ML and you know, the virtual age and the predictive analytics that we have, uh, a lot of the supervised machine learning <clears throat> to make sure that we can give employees the answers that they need quickly and then go on with their day so they're not spending time bogged down engage with IT. And then we take the use cases that are generally the, the low value, the menial work ones that are like VPN issues or uh, password reset and really drive that engagement to be able to drive a full end-to-end -end automated workflow. And it's resonating with our customers. You know, we, we've seen <clears throat> a 15% penetration with the pro SKU and our existing customer base. So there's still a tremendous amount of opportunity there. Um, but <clears throat> at the same time, th there is like that time to value that customers are really looking for as they get some of these, some of these outcomes from a machine learning perspective, which drive in the end, better experience 
and also help them be more effective in terms of how they're serving their customers from a knowledge works perspective. Gotcha. You, you, know, just, you, you mentioned the 15% penetration and um, it, I think it just shows how much opportunity is left there, but maybe how should we think about is, would every user that's using core ITSM today need to use pro or is it really meant for a certain level of work of IT worker inside of the, inside of the customer base? How should we think about maybe what's the realistic amount of people that would need a pro SKU versus just a traditional ITSM offering? Yeah, <clears throat> look, we see, we see a lot of, uh, a lot of demand from our customers as, as we're either going into renewals or, in net new on the pro SKU. And I think we're going to continue to see that. Like we'll, we'll get over 50% of our, of our customers onto pro for sure. The, the, the thing that we're seeing is there will probably be certain areas. Like if, if you think about maybe going down a little bit more into the commercial space and places where they're, where they don't need as many of those advanced capabilities that they're going to, they may stick with standard, but we do see like, especially in enterprise and large enterprise and some of our largest customers, like, that value to be able to drive the outcomes and leverage AI and ML at scale is, is something that customers are looking for. So you're right, there's still, still a lot of opportunity to go with, uh, with our pro SKU. Great, um, yeah, maybe taking a, a step back and looking, you know, again, a little bit more big picture. Uh, service has been in the market for a long time. You know, you mentioned that you guys have very healthy market share if we look at it against like a Gartner or IDC. How do you think about ServiceNow's differentiation at, at this stage versus some of your more well-known competitor, or no, not, not more well-known than you guys, but well-known competitors by the investing community like a BMC, um, you know, legacy micro focus? How should we think about that, the competitive environment and if there's been any change or evolution there as you think about net new or incremental ITSM deals? Sure. And, you know, so I've, I've been at the company for three years and it, and it probably took me a little while when I first joined to really understand this notion of this power of the platform that we talk about, um, which is something that it really started resonating when I hear customers come back and talk about the power of the platform that they, they're getting from ServiceNow. And really at the core, the fact that we are one platform with one data model and then one workflow that basically drives across it really enables something that I think is pretty revolutionary in industry basis and has been one of the reasons why we've been able to drive, you know, from our starting point in service management into the operations world, <clears throat> into <clears throat> the planning world, and then extend to other side of the business in the true platform of platforms view, break into <clears throat> breaking into other systems of record and integrating to them. And to me, like the reason why that is such a powerful story is because it means that we can ultimately deliver outcomes to customers. So from a service management perspective or an operations management perspective, we're able to break silos of the tools and the teams <clears throat> that companies have to be able to get work done more effectively and efficiently. And that happens at the workflow level. It also happens at the data level. And then the other thing that happens just from a speed of innovation perspective, yes, we'll, we'll bring companies in when we do an acquisition and that does mean that we're gonna re-platform them. But what it gives us is once we re-platform them, those capabilities are now available to internal customers or our own businesses as they build solutions or our own customers as they build solutions on top of the platform. And so what that means in the long run is an ability to innovate because we're not spending a lot of time on every release trying to integrate across the different solutions that we have <clears throat> because it's all native to the platform. So really that, that at the core I think is, is where, where the secret is. Great. And, you know, I think multiple times over the course of the conversation, you've mentioned machine learning and, and AI. And I know that's been a big focus for the company in terms of building that uh, into the existing platform. Can you maybe talk to how you're leveraging AI and ML in, in the IT product portfolio and, and ultimately, like, how are customers using that within the ServiceNow platform to, to extract value? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, as a as a product person, what, what I'll say is, it all starts with the outcomes for our customers. Like the, the most important thing for me is, are we delivering outcomes? What are those use cases? What are the personas, and how are those outcomes getting to value? And you know, focus both on employees, which is where a lot of the IT portfolio is, but also customers, because from an IT portfolio, we enable outcomes through our customer workflows as well, and making sure that those experiences are intuitive 
they're native, they're done, they're powerful is key. And what, what, I, what I'll say is AIML ends up being a means to an end to deliver that world-class experience. <clears throat> Taking the power of machine learning from all the data that's coming in, whether it's you know requests, tickets, others that are coming in from people or stuff that's coming in from sensors and from the environment and being able to use that, find those needles in the haystack to be able to deliver a better experience, <clears throat> whether that is at an employee level doing self-service so you can get your answer quickly and get on with your day, or on a knowledge worker level, being able to, to identify like, what are the things that they need to focus on that's gonna help either reduce time to resolve an issue or address the vulnerabilities that are most important and most critical to go and fix in the environment. <clears throat> like those are the outcomes that ultimately ML is gonna provide. And I think, you know, as you know, we, we've, been, we've done a fair amount in terms of acquisition dating back to uh, the beginning of 2017 when we, when we acquired DX Continuum uh, both from a machine learning perspective, NLU, NLP space, and then earlier this year, as we focus on AI ops and really making sure that those outcomes on the operational side are of value with our Loom acquisition, which ultimately really is bringing together the service and operations management to be able to identify those issues <laughs> and let knowledge workers quickly resolve problems for employees and customers. That, that's a, that's actually a good pivot point. So I, I had on my list of questions to ask about both Loom and I hope I don't butcher the saying Swiegel, I think is how it's pronounced. Yep. Um, and, and I know that was to bolster the, the ICOM capabilities. And I know you mentioned with Loom, the AI ops side as well. So, you know, maybe this is a good way to switch gears into, you know, how the company's momentum and IT operations management has looked and, you know, how both, how did those two acquisitions that are, that are a little bit more focused in that area, how should we think about that, the signal of where the importance of ITOM is or how much of a focus it is in 2020 and then maybe really beyond that? Yeah, <clears throat> no, uh, so, so as, as I mentioned, like if you think about the, what we're doing from a service management, from an operations management perspective, we really see those two capabilities driving the outcomes both on the employee customer side as well as uh, for knowledge workers. And, and more and more like customers are looking to drive those together, meaning like if I can understand something in my environment that's coming from the operation space, I can more quickly resolve issues or serve customers before they create a ticket or an incident. And, and you know, we've got, we've got, we've got a very healthy business with, operate, with ITOM. We can see that, we see that growing to be over a billion dollar business. And right now our, our second largest product and portfolio and growing healthily. Um, and and a, an acquisition like Loom really does bring those two pieces together to drive some of those outcomes. And, and you know, from a from a Loom perspective, you know, <clears throat> we've been very focused in AI ops and making sure that we're driving relevancy to take the operational world, find those needles in the haystack, which is really about getting those insights that AI ops drives. And then the secret that we bring to that puzzle is that we can actually drive the workflow on top of it. So a lot of AI ops is about understanding the world of data that you have, but with ServiceNow, you can actually drive automated workflows on top of it. And that's where we think like we, we lend an influence to the AI ops lens. And, and Loom is really helping us do that by taking all the data that exists and being able to quickly identify what is happening in the environment, get those needles in that haystack out, and then tie it to knowledge, tie it to insights, tie it to an actionable outcome that a team could go and then take. Um, and then from a Swiegel perspective, you know, one of the things that, that we talked about at our uh, Knowledge 20 conference um, in May, and, and we're gonna be talking about more in, uh, in Paris, is this notion of, of a service graph. And if you think about our CMDB and, and the system of record that we're, we're providing from a CMDB perspective, we think that like really as, as companies are, are driving outcomes in your operating estate, they really need to take a service level view of everything that they have. And what that means is it's not just about the infrastructure, the network, the devices, what you have on prem or in the cloud, but it's also about configuration and then application and service and being able to show that holistically. And so, you know, we are, we're announcing in, as part of our Paris release, some, some integrations that are from a service graph perspective, bringing in that core data to be able to provide that visibility. And then Swiegel, one of the things that it's gonna do is now it, it adds on this configuration layer so I can understand my configuration estate on top of my infrastructure estate 
to be able to drive better outcomes. And it ends up being a means to an end. It means that I can resolve issues more quickly from a service management perspective. I understand what's happening in my environment. I can tie it to my critical business services from an operations management perspective. Or on the security side, I can, I can resolve the, the vulnerabilities that I have that are tied to my most critical services first. So there's two threads I want to pull on there because, you know, this feels like now a lifetime ago, but back in late February, you guys had your federal forum. And when we were down there, uh, a lot of the feedback we often get is, is that um, having, the, you know, having the service now be the core configurement, configuration management database oftentimes leads to the adoption of ITOM or of GRC on the security side. So I think for those of us who maybe um, are, are not necessarily technologists by, by background, maybe if you could help us understand why it's so important to marry ServiceNow's CMDB offering and why that matters so much for the adoption of ITOM and for security as well. Yeah, and you know, I'll, I'll say this, like you know, we, do, we do build our solutions with the ability to drive them separate from a CMDB in mind. So you can do ITOM Health without, without a CMDB. Uh, but the reality is that the value proposition, you know, we talk, when I talked about that one platform and that one data model that lives in the architecture, like a lot of it at the core is fronted by the system of record of the operating state that you have. And the reality is that every solution that we have both feeds and gets from the CMDB. And that's true for the products that we build. That's true for ISV community and that's true for our customers as well. So as an example, when we populate the CMDB from an ITOM perspective, it means that now you can tie your incidents to your CIs, to the critical business services, which helps you prioritize and automate route work on the service management side. It also then helps you from an asset management perspective, understand your asset estate and quickly get to value to do uh, audits or uh, do, do entitlement checks for the assets that you have. And so the really that, that is a power of like how you bring the data into that CMDB drives all these outcomes that we have across the solution set. And while a lot of that does start on the IT side, it extends across the platform. So from a, from a customer service perspective, as an example, like you can deliver better customer service by understanding where an issue is, where it exists in your operating state, who that is tied to, so that now you can be proactive and engage with the customers that may be impacted when a pod in your environment goes down and you know who the customers are, you know the team that's working on it, and you can drive that better experience. So it's strength and upsell from an ITOM perspective, but really it, it really drives that disproportionate platform value that I talked about earlier as well. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it speaks to the, the platform being the core, allowing you to stitch everything together with one clean data model. So I, I'm just because we only have about seven, eight minutes left, I'm going to weave in some audience questions as sure. well. Uh, so the, the first one is a question that's focused on the, I believe, on AI ops. But the, the question is, how much of it's uh, service now internally built versus partnering with other companies such as a data dog, maybe just helping us understand um, what, what's native versus what's done by our partnerships. Yeah. So, so first I'll talk internally and I'll talk about the ecosystem. So, you know, over the time I've been here in the last few years, we've been very invested in terms of building out those AI and ML capabilities for the operating of state, uh, whether that's our operational intelligence solution, what we're doing from a health perspective with bringing events in and driving correlation and outcomes, as well as some of the acquisitions like Loom that are helping accelerate some of the outcomes that we want to drive from an AI ops perspective. And as I said, like you know, that the AI ops world is really taking a massive amount of data and then trying to drive insight from that data. And then on top of that, you know, we're also invested in making sure that then you can go and take automated outcomes from those insights. And so we've got a healthy build path and a lot of the MLAI acquisitions that we've done, like DX Continuum and other are helping us do that because we're leveraging those under the covers to be able to drive incident prioritization or do better correlation um, within, within ServiceNow. Now, I'll say this, you know, in the end, it's an ecosystem. And we understand like our customers are going to have hundreds, if not thousands of different solutions or tools that they're using across the software lifecycle to plan, dev, build, and, del and deliver operations. And so our view is, really driving a full end-to-end -end single platform view across all those integrated platforms. And 
you know, you've seen this in some of the analyst reports around, um, you know, value streams, managing the value stream layer. Like we really see our ability to drive that value stream and then do integrations with those different solutions to be able to bring that all into one common pane of glass and then drive those workflows across it. So it ends up being joint win-wins for our customers with the observability solutions, with what we have on the platform. And ultimately the long-term goal is get those customers to the outcomes and provide that single pane that really lets you do the work across IT and then into the other uh, parts of the C3. Great, that's, uh, that's very helpful. And then, you know, um, another one that, uh, you know, as much as this is focused mostly on products, but maybe a more short-term oriented one, obviously COVID is on everybody's mind and the associated impact. I'm just, I'm curious, maybe if you could talk to what you see from your seat, what, you know, in terms of customer dynamics, whether that's retention or how customer conversations have evolved for the deals that you're an executive sponsor for, just how, how has customer behavior been as far as you view it in terms of decision-making? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so in, you know, outside of the pandemic, like when, when I talk to customers, like a lot of focus is from a technology perspective, how can I drive a better experience for employees and customers? Uh, you know, how can I do it, oper drive operational productivity and then innovate more quickly? Uh, and in the pandemic, that the productivity on the operational side really like there's been a big focus on operational resilience uh and the other big thing that's also been sort of at a short term there's been a focus on like you know, how can how can you help me save costs and whether that's going to like an itsm pro that's helping drive uh drive better reflection and make sure that your teams are focused on the things that are highest value or from an asset management perspective understanding your license position and being able to to save if you're if you're underutilizing solutions. And so, you know, I, I think like, as I think of those outcomes and I think about the conversations that, that I'm having with CIOs and CTOs uh, and their directs, like in the end, through this pandemic, like there has been a, a shift in focus in like a few areas of, hey, like cost saving is important. I need to be able to drive ROI around the solution, which we ultimately think we have a strong value proposition for. And, you know, broadly speaking, like, if you look at across our customer base and serving the enterprise and large enterprise, um, because it's it's a you know th these are the, the largest companies uh, in the world. Like there there's a lot of resilience, and even though we've seen some impact in uh, certain industries, we've also seen focus. Like we had a, um, as an example in the hotel space, like one of our largest security deals ever. Uh, we closed through this pandemic. So even amidst some of the headwinds that there are, like there have been in this time frame, so we've seen healthier pipeline than we've ever had. Uh, you know, definitely comparing to previous years, uh, and we do see as we look forward. The big thing I would say is in my conversations with IT technology leaders is that they do see this shift and the need that the pandemic has has really accelerated a long term view to drive digital transformation and make sure that customers are on the, the companies are on the other side of this digital divide, and so. Actually, that, that's been reflected sort of as we look forward in sort of our future pipeline and sort of the strength that we see going forward as, you know, this uh, pandemic continues. Very helpful. So I, I have time for one more question for, for the people that are pinging me. Uh, so I'll end with a product question. You know, I think DevOps makes a lot of sense for ServiceNow as a natural extension. So maybe just how, how important do you see that for, for customers and how do you our conversations in terms of cross-selling DevOps into install base going from your perspective. Yeah, so let me, I'll talk about it first at a concept level and we can, we can talk about the, the specific sure. product as well. But, you know, at concept level, as you, as customers are trying to go and, and digitally transform, they're, they're focused on a few things. They want to be more agile. They want to move workloads to cloud. They want to innovate more quickly at, at the core. And they're trying to do so and they're trying to bridge the central pieces that they have within IT to the teams that they're working with that are doing the engineering. And that could be a team that is working on waterfall, um, uh, you know, for like an ERP deployment or something like that, or more and more, it's these digital teams that are trying to move much more quickly and innovate fast. And as every company becomes a software company, like IT is really trying to look across both of these and drive that pace of innovation while maintaining security and governance and quality through the pipeline. And so, 
that ends up being a very strong value proposition for us, which is we're already the trusted advisor in the central IT. And now it's a bridge and a connection to these teams to be able to enable them to, to work and collaborate more quickly as the worlds of what you'd say traditional IT and the engineering teams are coming closer together. And so we see that as a, as a, strong, as a strong tailwind for us. Our DevOps product really does provide some of those capabilities, but really it's across our entire product line, like our operations management, or even from a planning perspective, our ITBM solution, making sure that we're driving both visibility into the waterfall world, as well as the agile world, really brings that single pane of glass together. So net net, I think I am very optimistic around how we enable customers to drive to the other side of uh, this digital chasm by providing these capabilities. And DevOps is definitely one of the ways that we're doing that. Great. Well, Pablo, we really appreciate your time. I think that that was, I know it was very helpful for me to dig in deeper into the technology and product side and, and your insights were definitely unique to, to some of the conversations we have. So thank you so much for your time today. Hope all is well on your end. And we, if we tried to get to as many questions as we could for, for the audience, but I, I'm going to go ahead and just apologize. We only had 25 minutes, but thanks again for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thanks everybody.